Well, a, a boy's best friend is his mother. Kill her, mommy. Kill her. We'll tear your soul apart. Live or die. I'm not even gonna swat that fly. I hope they are watching. They'll see. They'll see and they'll know. And they'll say, that she wouldn't even have a fly. This six year old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face. The blackest eyes. The devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him. And when he never said him, tried to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. It was 1945, the night of the graduation dance. The war overseas had just ended. The terror at home Boy. was about to begin. Roy? Come on. Come on, kid. Don't let hard to get. What about New Year's Eve? Well, that was different. I couldn't help myself. The Prowler. If he wants you, he'll get you. Tonight, the terror begins again. They never found out who did it. But it had to be someone in town, someone who knew that she was called Rose. And Mark, that guy still might be around here. Oh, God, I don't believe this. You're talking about something that happened over 30 years ago. Whenever the time was right, he'd come back. The Prowler. If he wants you, he'll get you. Night after night, he waited for her. The Prowler. If he gets you, you wish you were dead. safe, but you're dead wrong. The Prowler, coming soon. All right, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Back to the Blockbuster with your host, KS and Jackson. Jackson is away getting his proper education on, but in his absence, we are moving ahead with Tales of Horror with another special guest with us. I got uh, Roger from Dark Knight of the Podcast with me today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. A pleasure. I appreciate it. Oh, no problem at all. Um, you know, I you were one of the uh, this page was one of the first that I actually messaged this year for Tales of Horror, and I'm glad that we uh, got uh, 
you know, something down on the schedule because uh, I actually like went through some of the stuff like, with your show and it seemed like a you know fun time as well. And uh, yeah, I'm just looking forward to talking about the movie that you picked because I hadn't watched it in a really long time. Um, but before uh, we get into uh, the movie that you chose, Roger, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your show, anything that you want to throw out to uh, promote yourself. Uh, this is the time to do it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Roger Connors. I am co-host on Dark Knight of the Podcast uh, alongside my co-host, Troy Escamilla. Um, we are both uh, independent filmmakers. Uh, we met working on film together. Um, we're big slasher fanatics and we're both gay men. So our podcast oftentimes analyzes um, horror from a queer perspective perspective. I think that horror has a really deep undercurrent within the queer community, and I think there's a huge fan base for horror, uh, LGBTQIA across the board. Um, I think we find a, a connectivity with the genre in, in so many ways, so many senses. Um, and so we really like to explore that with both classic titles, like obscure titles. Uh, we really like to specialize in films that maybe don't get a lot of love and attention. Um, so you find some really obscure indie gems that we cover, but we like to throw out some mainstream ones as well. Um, but it's a good time, and we've been doing it since you know, since COVID, you know, it was our, it was our <laughs> like coping mechanism. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but it's stuck. <laughs> it's stuck. And, um, and, you know, I'm super grateful for it. It's gotten me um, so many great opportunities. I'm now, you know, involved with the Houston Horror Film Festival. I go out there and I handle their panels with all their different celebrities. And I've met a lot of amazing people and talents who I grew up admiring. And so it's open doors for me. And I really, I just, I love talking about horror. My partner does not. So this is my way of, <laughs> of like getting it out of my system and, and people enjoy listening. So it's become one of my favorite aspects of my day to day. That's awesome. Uh, have you tried to get your partner into discussing horror or is it just not a non-starter? Uh, I mean, <laughs> certain titles. He here's the thing: is like he doesn't like like anything that's like real, like true life violence. Like if it's fantastical, okay. he can be sold. But like I like, I mean, I the way I feel, I know I'm sane is like when I watch a horror movie, I can be like ha ha ha. ha. But then I see like real gore and reality. Like if I see real blood, I get sick to my stomach and vomit. Yeah. So I still have this like differentiation. But I feel like I'm like testing my limits watching horror. So it's right. to me, it's like. It's, it's the equivalent of what, like, Romans did back when they had the Colosseum and watched people get eaten by lions. Only now we know it's not real. So it shows evolution. <laughs> it shows that we're still <laughs> curious with morbid, like, violent, gory things. But we're finding different ways to explore that. But there's some people who just don't need that. My partner is one of them. Uh, so I just dump all of it on my, my podcast co-host instead. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel you. It was, that's interesting because, like, uh, actually over the weekend, one of our friends, he, like, it was cut it cut his finger you like barely cut it but it bled a lot and it was like one of those like small things that turned into a big thing oh, yeah. and like and then like i walked up the stairs to the apartment and there's like like little droplets trails and i was like ah oh, like oh. freaked out by it and my friend sitting next to me and he was just like dude you watch like the goriest horror movies ever and this is bothering you i was like no but when it's real it's like it's different like i know the difference yeah. between real and real you know yeah so, like that's what that's the you know main thing so yeah, yeah. I definitely feel you on that. Yeah, that's how we know we're sane. Like it's, it's yeah, exactly. <laughs> we test the limits enough with like fake horror that like when real things happen, I can differentiate it. And yeah, no. So I mean, horror is truly like the main theme of my of my day to day. Like everything I do, whether I'm working on a movie, I'm working on a podcast, I'm working on a slasher right now. That's an LGBTQIA themed slasher called Meat. Um, that really taps into the violent themes of horror, but also has a, a very queer, coherent queer storyline that I, I want to kind of challenge people on both sides of the spectrum. You know, if you're right. not necessarily a horror fan, but you want to see a really awesome queer story, you have that. But, you know, maybe horror fans that don't really expose themselves to queer storylines, this is a film that's promising a whole lot of gore, and it's extremely violent. I don't think those lines always those streams always cross you know what right, i mean right. so that that's really my goal and so i i'm excited to talk about this title today too the one that that we decided on because um it's a film that i've been taking a lot of influence from because it is a film that plays up like when it has moments of violence when it has moments of gore it freaking yeah. hits it hits yeah. hard yeah it definitely does um and yeah i will give you the opportunity to uh you actually uh 
we're going between two movies, and uh, I would have been fine with either one of them. Um, but uh, let everyone uh, know what you ultimately uh, landed on. Yeah, so the the film that I decided to focus on was The Prowler, 1981, um, which is a film that I think uh, kind of gets lost in the shuffle. Um, you know what I mean? Like, I, oftentimes when you think of, like, the films that define the genre, like, the, you always go to, like, Friday the 13th, then Michael Myers, and, you know, Freddy, like, but, like, The Prowler is a film that only gets brought up by diehards, and yeah. it shocks me because, like, when it comes to the key things I want out of a quality slasher, <laughs> they are there in The Prowler. Does it have other issues? Does it have pacing issues? We'll talk about it. But <laughs> the, when the main things I'm looking for, when I'm looking for a good 1980s slasher, The Prowler fucking has them. So that was my first selection, The Prowler. Um, other selection, The Strangers. Yeah. So, and I, th I think with The Strangers, I think that <sighs> I've heard so much conversation coming up since the, 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 the genre, you know, or at least this specific title has started doing these kind of retcons where like, is it a remake? Is it not a remake? Doing our own thing with it. Here's the freaking deal. In my personal opinion, The Strangers is a film that is a masterclass of suspense. I don't think yeah. really any of the the retreadings of this storyline have have captured the pure sense of building developing dread that the first movie had i think the sequel is great and a lot of fun yeah but it's a totally different film and these two films as parallels are two films that take a lot of time to build suspense to build dread and i think these are two titles that go really well together because it's almost a, a matter of preference with a lot of people do you like a slow burn suspense yeah. or do you just want to get right to it do you have a preference personally i'm curious i have no idea do you prefer um, one or the other i actually look i like a good slow burn um because i'm i'm pretty patient <laughs> and if and then if it's and if the atmosphere is good and the tension is like builds in a certain way i can totally take a slow burn i actually i like the payoff if the payoff like the payoff has to be worth it but if the payoff is good then i can like i can indulge you for a good like you know absence of like certain amount of action for a certain period of time yeah. you know as long as the uh, resolution is good and the payoff's great but yeah, yeah. i agree like they're both they're both they both are pretty uh slow burn movies uh and the prowler in particular i mean it is certainly a product of its time i mean I, I i actually didn't know until uh looking more into it for this how overlooked it was i kind of thought it was you know the same way moderately successful as like some of the clones that came out during that time period, like the prom nights and all that and right. terror train or something like that too. Um, but found out that, you know, it like barely made a million dollars when it came out uh, in 1981. And it, uh, it wasn't until later down the road that it got, you know, the recognition that it probably deserves some uh, great people attached to it. I mean, Joseph Zito directed Friday 13th final chapter, which is amazing. I think that's what got him that job was uh, the fact that he directed this. And then you got uh, Tom Savini uh, Gorefix in it, which um, he claims, at least in one interview I read, that he thinks is some of his best work, if not his best work. So um, really good stuff in it. Um, fair, I think also think very unique for the kind of uh, slasher movie it is, because in a lot of ways it is kind of like a gory, almost exploitation slasher film. But then it has moments where it looks and feels a lot more sophisticated than it should. Like the cinematography is really good. Um, it, you know, the whole, you know, the fact that it, you know, begins in 1945 then comes in the present day, at least, you know, present day then is pretty unique too. I guess there are some similarities between this and like the original, like My Bloody Valentine a little bit. Um, but I don't know. I still think it's pretty unique. It has issues for sure, but I think it's unique enough where it stands out amongst the pack a bit. Yeah, I think the thing is like the strengths that this film has are so strong that for me it definitely outweighs the flaws it has, which are mostly like the pacing. And that's right. the first thing you hear like when the prowler comes up, people will say it's so slow. And like it is slow. <laughs> Some people yeah. like it slow. I I like it slow. <laughs> but I'll say this, like one of the reasons I picked this title is recently I watched the prowler with a group of like nine people, nine, 10 people. It was the cast of a, a project I was working with and they're like, pick a movie. And I was like, I want the Prowler. So I wa we watched it and like, it was great. But a lot of these were um, 
I mean, I was honestly, it was a pretty mixed bag of people and personalities. That was cool about yeah. it. But a lot of these were people that I could tell when it was getting slower, they were kind of like, Ugh. like they were, you know, and, <laughs> and for me as somebody who I was like looking around, like, oh, being like, oh God, like, are they not liking it? And it's not yeah. that it's just, it is like, you know, when it takes its time through some of these, like, just long winded, like strolling through houses. I could give you a blueprint of that fucking mansion. May I yeah. swear? May yeah, I swear? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, you can. Go ahead. That mansion, I could draw it like from memory. Like, like if you needed a police sketch of that mansion, I could give you the whole thing because I've seen the whole mansion. They walk through it so much, so many times in this movie. Yeah. Um, but one thing, like when I watched it again this time too, like, you know, when I said the strengths in this are so strong, I mean, truly, I think that there are several aspects of this film that are top tier within the slasher genre. The killer's aesthetic is horrifying. When you put that in the right lighting, the right shadow play, that is an intimidating fucking killer. I mean, he yep. is scary. He's got that bayonet. He's coming at you. He's running. Uh, I don't know how he can see, but he's a he's yeah, former exactly. military. So he's doing fine. He's killing people. Then you've got this amazing score underneath yeah. everything he's doing and so some of these slower moments though they are extremely long-winded these strings like the plucking of st strings and these ominous tones coming into play keep that suspense building even at times where it does feel like it's maybe dragging on a bit long um i really think the score is is one of the major aspects of this film that helps it transcend beyond a lot of the ripoffs that you did mention. There were so many movies like this coming out at that time, but not yeah. many of them sounded this good, you know? Yeah. Yeah, not all of, of them sounded this good. None of them actually looked this good either. I mean, I'm surprised. I mean, it's, I don't, it, I think uh, Joseph Zito, when I listened to the commentary track, he said they ended up making it for about a million dollars. So about what it ended up making when it came out. Um, but it feels like they put more effort into not making it just like a trashy kind of slasher movie like they kind of felt the story was a little bit more like uh deserving of something better than just kind of making it like uh you know like an exploitation kind of gore fest and i that's why i actually appreciate the slow moments like and you're right that you i you can probably get every detail of that mansion because there is a lot of like slow walks through it uh where you practically feel like you probably live there <laughs> by the time you know, the movie's over mm -hmm. but i actually appreciate that, that stuff i mean i like that it, it was different from like its counterparts i mean it probably got lost in the shovel because it wasn't as like fast-paced as its counterparts were but um i think it makes it a little bit better than some of them too like in the yeah, long run yeah. It's pretty simple story, like when you think about it. Like, I mean, and you had mentioned this earlier, but like that opening, that that throwback to the 1940s. Like, if you want to talk about what makes this film feel polished, I mean, I've seen a lot of films attempt a flashback and not pull it off on the scale. This looks yeah. polished. That gigantic grand campus, like all of the buildings on that campus. There's not a ton of locations in this film, but the ones that yeah. they do use, they use them so well and they light them so well and they pack them with extras. It feels lived in. It doesn't feel uh, like a, in any way, it doesn't feel like a low budget production. You know, this is a very polished, sophisticated film, but like, you know, everyone talks about the gore in this film and that really is like the cherry on top of the cake. It is the strongest aspect yeah. of this movie, but you have been mentioning the cinematography and we cannot avoid acknowledging the fact that the reason that these kills look so so great is because they are shot in, in a way that it looks just decadent like the colors yeah. the richness of the bloods that pool scene when she's yeah. getting that throat cut and you see that red just crimson red pouring down her she hits the water and it's pooling in the water i mean it looks it's art i mean it's terrifying it's gory it's even sexualized, but it's artistic. And a lot of the ripoffs that were coming out at this time were not filmed in a way that made them feel like you're watching actual cinema, like you are watching right. art. Yeah, exactly. Um, so for those that don't know, why don't you give uh, everyone a little uh, cliff notes version of what the movie is about? Um, yeah, as far as like when we're kicking things off. Yeah. Yeah, so the you know the Prowler, it's it's a pretty simplistic story. Uh, it's very much a vengeance tale. It starts in 1944. World War II is wrapping up, and you basically learn this backstory about this this couple that's having what is somewhat of an affair. This girl just left a relationship for this guy, and just as they're kissing under this gazebo, 
they are massacred in brutal style. And so it's kind of this yeah. like urban legend that forms around this, this school campus. So you flash forward to what is present day for that film. It's 1981. Um, but you now you come back to the campus where this whole story has kind of become, like I said, this urban legend. And it kind of comes up at this time every year. And they finally decide to like resurrect this dance, which has been very taboo. Uh, and this That's whole thing of mystery for ages now. And they finally decide to resurrect it. And with this dance being a thing, of course, a series of murders start to happen on the campus. And they're done in a way that's very um, hush hush. It's not like the bodies are just out in the open. People are trying to figure out what's happening. People are going missing, but people don't know where they went. Things are happening without people even being aware. The killer is very intimidating. He is donning a full military fatigue, uh, you know, hat and all. Um, and yep. he's terrifying, and he's going around killing these students uh, in standard slasher formula, but with a storyline that is just evolving and kind of unwinding right. and untwining as, as you're progressing. Um, and so that's the whole mystery is who is behind these murders, as it often is. Um, but I think it's handled in a way that's really a, a quite a good mystery and keeps you invested as, as a viewer. What do you think? Yeah, it's interesting, too, because like uh, with how it starts, you know, you have this girl, Rosemary, who's, you know, breaking up with her boyfriend who's you know away fighting during world war ii right like she's t saying that she you know doesn't want to be with him and uh anymore and now she's moved on to, you know with this new guy her new her new beau as you said and i i like that i mean it, it to me it wasn't so much about like the who done it part of it right because it's like you know it this this whoever killed them in the opening is you know, the assumption is like you know must be the pissed off boyfriend uh that's what you know you're thinking like when that says away it opens right and then uh you know, all these years later, like them resurrecting this dance and everything brings up in whoever is that person, you know, still, you know, attempting to stalk these people, that this brings something out in him again to, you know, kind of recreate this kind of murder spree all over again. And I think uh, that makes it a little bit more interesting than the standard, uh, you know, like kind of slice and dice slasher movie. There's a little bit more of a, you know, a reason behind uh what's going on uh which i thought was pretty interesting um and you know not something you would get really you know from a 19 you know 80s early 80s uh slasher movie that you know the the motive of if anything is a bit more uh a little bit more complex than it you know probably would be in any other movie which i thought was pretty interesting too I agree on that. And I think one thing to say about this film is like, you know, this is this is very early 1980s and and while this is like the popular upsurge of the slasher genre the storylines haven't been beaten to death by this point like you know, right. it still feels fresh and the story like while it's a mystery and you're trying to figure out who it could be it's not like it's a film where like the whole revelation like they're really reaching for it like this is a pretty simple story again this is a vengeance story bringing up this dance is obviously whoever is responsible for the murders or whoever is related to that person this dance is clearly bringing something out of somebody and there's all these little red herring moments that come up you get introduced to different characters there's this whole side story going on about um like you know a murderer getting closer to the campus and so forth mm -hmm. like where like they're they're bringing up these other ideas that are kind of keeping you questioning is it actually rosemary's former lover right. or right. is there something else at play um and so that does it that does this movie a lot of justice because as it's building up to the final revelation there's plenty of people it could be there's plenty of outcomes that could still be the case before they finally reveal it um so yeah i really think that like this the storyline it just doesn't feel tired it doesn't feel like they're trying to one up the movies that came before it it still feels very natural and simple and it works in its simplicity because the story is so simple though there's times where it feels like they're filling they're f filling time <laughs> and slowing down the pacing Pace. to try to yeah. build the suspense, which I mentioned earlier. And it, it does almost feel like in some ways, there does feel like there's maybe a couple loose strings here that I personally, upon a recent watch, felt like, oh, I would have liked a little more closure there. I would have liked to, to find out a little more outcome. Uh, like the whole thing with the major watching those two kids making out. Like, yeah. <laughs> don't know why. Don't know why. Yeah. How'd he get down there? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, like, I got questions that I need answered. And they don't really get answered. But overall, like, I do think this film does a pretty good job of, like, sticking the landing. Like, from the beginning to the end, this movie knows exactly the story it's trying to tell. And while it might do it 
slowly at times, when it does finally hit its stride, when it is delivering moments of action, horror, violence, when it chooses to kick into gear, it motherfucking kicks into gear. <laughs> like, that's no, where I gotta right. give this movie credit, man. This film, Tom Savini says it's his best work. I think I agree on that, honestly. I think that these effects are shocking. They're almost heightened reality in a way. Certain things yeah. about the redness of the blood, the eyes rolling back to the point that they're white when he gets stabbed through the skull. I've got a t-shirt yeah. with that face on it because I think it's one of the best visuals to come out of the slasher genre to date. And I think that some of the kills in this movie are just so, truly some of the best within the genre. It's phenomenal, phenomenal work. Yeah, what I realized, um, I so I saw this movie officially for the first time when I was like maybe 16. Mm -hmm. and But I didn't realize that kill, the guy who gets stabbed through the skull and his eyes go white. I apparently at least saw that image or knew that image from way younger. And that image has stuck with me for a really long time. It's a it's a very jarring image. It's frightening, um, and to see that as a kid was pretty, uh, you know, probably something I shouldn't have seen as young as I did. But I but I remember that somehow, like that isolated moment in that scene. And I remember when I saw the movie for the first time, I was like, oh, that's where this is from. And it definitely is. I mean, it I, all the kills are like you said. It feels like art. And you, you talk about the redness of the blood and everything. But I felt like you could also feel all of them too. Like there, like there's an intensity to all of them where it almost feels like it's happening to you, and and then they hold on them for a really long time. Like it's not just like a quick, you know, a quick slice and dice. It it lingers, and I and I I will say it lingers to the point where I actually don't think it's gratuitous. I think it works for uh, the movie. Like you know, in, in lesser hands, it could have been like that's too much. I I'm seeing too much, but uh, Tom Savini has an art to creating effects like that. And I think Joseph Zito had an art of directing those kind of uh, uh, sequences as well. And I, you know, that's why it lingering all that stuff didn't bother me at all. I was like, this is in its own way, you know, no, non horror fans won't agree, but it is art in its own uh, way for sure. Uh, oh, absolutely. And I, I, I think like even, I, I think the one thing that has to be acknowledged is I really don't think there's a wasted kill in the movie. Like, you know, we have right. seen, we have seen plenty of, of films that have like two or three great kills and then there's a ton that feel like throwaways. This film, you can tell that every single kill, they're like, this is a moment. Like, and some of the ones that aren't even really talked about a ton, like the teacher running and getting, you know, grabbed through the gate and getting stabbed through the throat. And it like, yeah. it is lingering. Like you mentioned, like it, it, it shows it sitting in the throat for like seconds and you see the blood yeah. hitting her shoes. Like they don't shy away from it. And, and it's greatly in the film's favor because they do know what they're doing. This is not like a little indie production where they've got nothing but like tissue paper and like some liquid latex and some fake scab. This is a film where like when they're doing a kill, Savini is just in, in top form and he's showing yeah. the full physicality of it. It's not like when things happen that the actor just has to freeze and there's like no motion. Like when she's getting stabbed in that pool or getting her throat cut in that pool and she's thrashing around Lisa and you see it yeah. digging through her throat, it oh. genuinely looks to me as though a woman's throat is being cut in front of my face. And then you, you know, we're talking about the artistry as the body sinks into the pool and you see the blood just billowing out of the wound just like, like filling the pool yeah. with red like it's a very intentional shot and i keep coming back to that moment because you know if we're going to talk about horror being art there's a lot of intention that went behind every single one of those kills yeah i agree i mean i think it's uh it's the girl that gets killed in the shower is that sherry uh with the pitchfork Ugh. um like that one like you know it also lingers and like when you're watching it it's crazy how seamless it all looks like it looks like you know you you can't really tell where like the makeup effect begins and the real person ends. Basically, it looks like she is being impaled with an actual pitchfork, like the actress itself. So like you know, I'm when I was watching it today, I was just like, dude, I can't believe that you can't really tell like where this was like an effect at all. Like it looks so real and so seamless, and the fact that you know it's you know not a lot of money, and even in, like 1981 standards, is like. It's crazy how, what they were able to do with so little. I mean, you even mentioned, like, not just with the gore, but even like you mentioned with the opening scene and everything, like, it does feel way more polished that opening <clears throat> than it probably should. 
-hmm. like you know like for a low budget horror movie i mean that was like when i first saw the movie that was my first thought i was like wow they put a lot into this you know for something that lasts maybe what a little more five minutes however long the opening is like that you know that attention to detail is something i think that should be acknowledged from the movie a little bit more because it really is uh really makes it stand out from some of the other movies that were going up against it yeah yeah i think and like you know and i don't want to be like aces across the board because again there's yeah, definitely yeah, things no, you're right. <laughs> to talk about but like one thing i think that also doesn't get a ton of credit here is like this is honestly a cast of characters that i don't mind watching like how many times have we seen a slasher where all of the characters are detestable or yeah. wooden or like you know you mentioned the character sherry she's technically she's this she's the, the second focal victim, you know, once right. the, the killer comes back, she and her boyfriend are killed in that amazing shower double, double kill okay. that right. just is just holds up against anything you see today. Um, mm -hmm. This character, Sherry, is a delight. She's like a little pixie. She's fluttering around. She's so pleasant. <laughs> she's very likable. You know, she's played very believable, very yeah. relatable. All of the characters in this. And like, I think Pam, like, you know, a lot of people say Pam doesn't do a lot. Well, you know what? This is a slow burn, simmering, like slowly developing story. This finale for this movie, like not to jump all the way forward, but if we're going to talk about yeah. characters, like the character progression and a female lead, a final girl who, when she needs to step up to the plate, has quite a fantastic final sequence with this killer and does what she has to do to survive against him. I don't think Pam gets that much credit. Like she's played really well. She's very yeah. likable. She's endearing. She makes good choices. She's not stupid. Uh, and she's proactive. And I think she's just a really good character. And I feel, I'm always confused like why like she wouldn't come up more in the dialogue of like cool final girls. Cause that last, that finale, man, it- It's pretty good. Yeah. Hits, dude. It hits. I, um, I, I'm glad you said that. Cause when my friend watched it, he said the same thing about her. He was like, oh, does this seem like she does much? Like she, uh, it compared to most final girls in movies like this. And I agree that like it is a slow burn for her too. Like it builds up to what she needs to do in the during the climax of the movie. Um yeah, he 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 found her to be like a little bit for, forgettable, but I think she kinda holds her own. I mean it's not no, no one's giving like a tour de force performance here. It's not like no one's winning Oscars. But it's like it's it's good for the material. And uh I think she more than holds her own. Uh especially you know i love watching the bill from like how we meet her when we first get introduced to her to where she ends up by the end of the movie and mm -hmm. you know the kind of strength that she has to like uh, build up to um by the end of the movie um i think that deserves a little bit more credit too i mean i i, I understood what my friend was trying to say because like yeah there are a lot of other final girls who you know who not just action proactive who are a bit more proactive in the plot you know throughout the whole movie when you know but like she i, I she doesn't have to be like everyone else either. Like she, right. I think she's perfectly fine for the story that they're telling. Right. Yeah. No. No. I'm. I'm on the same page with that. I think. I. You know. If I'm going to get a character like that, I want more than anything. I want to believe the the actor. I want to believe that this character could really exist. And sometimes I think in these movies, right. like, yeah, it's, it's awesome to see a final girl go all Ripley. You know, it's it's a great experience. Yeah. I love Patricia Tallman's Barbara take in Night of the Living Dead, Savini. You know, like characters like that. It's awesome. It's empowering. But also there's something to be said about like characters who just feel real, lived in. Yeah. Like, you know, she is a college student. She is a young, blonde, like sorority girl. Like she's not really armed or mentally prepared to take on any of the responsibility that will be thrown on her over the course of this film, including right. killing, killing a man. But yeah, you know exactly. what? Like, I mean, and even like the first encounter she has with who is the killer, like that whole stairwell sequence that, you know, again, another moment taking its time. She goes in, she's changing her dress after getting I, the dress yeah. spilled on it. The shower's running. She almost walks in. Like, you know, it's slow, but it's really, really utilizing the, the timing. It's a very intentional and in going so slow. So finally, when there's this moment of her coming down that staircase and that yeah. she's looking up and she just gets that that shot of him coming down around the corner of the stairs i mean girl books it like she is not she's yeah. not going in to check on what's going on she's you know yeah. what i'm saying she is she gets the the fuck out yeah, of there she, she's smart she like dart she darts out of there which is like uh i you know, i love that whole moment too because 
uh, I love any scene that's like you're like okay like when is something gonna happen like we already know that they're both dead in the shower I love that it kind of is like a little bit of dark humor like her commenting on her being in the shower and then like kind of shutting the door and when she does shut the door there's just like blood all over the door because I, I mean like that stuff is like really fun and really cool too but I yeah. and I love that like you know he's so close to like she's in that room and like he's just putting down the rose on uh, Cherry's face while she's doing all that stuff. So like you're waiting for like when is he gonna pop up and attack her? When is, if she is she gonna discover like this thing, this grisly scene? Like I love that that takes his time. And then yeah. even and then even her first encounter, you know, her seeing him like just in the stairwell is like a really cool shot. But I do love that there's not a, there's no hesitation that she's just like I'm not you know getting out of here uh, as she should. I mean. Uh, she does get slowed down, of course. Uh, right. Guy grabs her. Yeah, but like it, it, I do love. I love that that that's how that scene plays out. And like you know, I I think because horror movies now we're used to like a lot of the final girls being a bit more proactive and sassy within the plot. That's just not her character at all. Like right. uh, one of my buddies who saw it was like, well, she kind of looks like she gives me like Amy Steele vibes, but she doesn't really act like her right. uh, from Friday Thirteenth Part Two. But I mean, and, and and you know, and that character Ginny, she she gets to be a little sassy with Paul and all that stuff before all the stuff happens in the climax. So they feel that she's a bit stronger as a character in the end, but I don't, I didn't need this character to play like that too. I, I mean, I like that. She is how we meet her, a typical like college girl who is then thrown into uh, a situation, like an impossible situation. And we are kind of seeing her react to it in real time and kind of like grow from that in real time rather than, you know, forcing her to be, something that she really isn't for the sake of like entertaining us i guess right right yeah no yeah, I, I think that even the supporting characters in this though too like i mean like i mean down to the cameos like i'm I, you don't have to give credit to that big man in that hotel uh or you know like you know the guy that's that the, the guy that's like sitting there working at that like that little yeah. crappy little inn who's like taking the call and like and um marks on the, the phone with him like you know being like, can you just take a message? He's like, I can take a message. <laughs> He's like, being all sassy. And I'm like, this guy's yeah. the real star of the show. But like yep. all the characters across the board, like people don't feel paper thin. You know, people have very natural reactions to each other. Um, I think the teacher, you know, you've even got like little characters like the teacher who seems very like warm and endearing. And then she gets mur murdered horribly. Like I think yeah. one big thing is a lot of the characters you're seeing here that are victims here, like, do really feel like they're completely innocent and do not have it coming. Like, this is not a film that's crammed full of detestable characters. There's a few people that make some crummy choices, like Lisa, like, you're kind of like, okay, like, you're kind of a bitch, like, I'm saying <laughs> yeah, right yeah. now. And then yeah. uh, the 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 drunk, uh, was it Paul, the one that gets thrown in the into prison yeah. because he's being, a, like, a loud, drunk asshole. But, like, a lot of the characters that do get killed don't really have it coming it's just a matter of like they're they're at the wrong time and they are the yep. a victim <laughs> you know like that's all yeah, it is yeah. and like and so it, and i think that makes this movie feel like a little bit higher stakes because really like you know in talking about pam and and how she applies to the story what i think really makes it work for me is she is just your everyday girl who really was just they're in that building at the wrong time and kind of becomes the focus of it. Focus and she of, has yeah. to defend herself simply because she was there. That's scary to me. That works for me, you know? Yeah, I actually like that part too, that it's not so much that she is like this intricate part of the plot or like the backstory or anything like that. Is It really is a wrong place, wrong time scenario for her. And yeah. then uh, and in that, and in that she becomes like the focus of like, you know, um, being pursued by him. Uh, right. Just because of you know where she ends up, um, I actually like that. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't need every uh, you know person in the movie to be like intricately connected to like what went on in the past or like you know that that could be fun, I guess. Like if you wanted to have like a big like exposition, like this is why it's happening at the end kind of moment, like monologue, that would be I guess cool if you wanted to do that. Right. I'm also glad that it avoids that too uh, with its right. resolution. I didn't really need that um, as well. Uh, it, you know, it was like I said. I mean, when I first saw it, I was like, okay, is it supposed to be a who done it? I guess not. Um, even though, like you said, they throw in like red herrings and all that stuff too. Um, and you know, it's a matter of like, okay, not exactly who. Like, we know maybe why. Of course, this is happening, but I guess it's going to come down to which one of these people could be tied to this thing that happened a long time ago. And you know, 
is still very uh, upset about it. Um, do you do you really think that uh, when you're when you were watching it that it gave you an indication of like who it was gonna be uh, while you were watching it? I think because like your natural instinct is to think that it is going to be the same person that did it the first time like no matter what no matter what they're throwing at me the viewer i'm automatically my first instinct is going to be like well whoever is doing it i'm thinking it's the same guy that did it before and like by age group alone that (laughs) dwindles it down significantly (laughs) like it sure ain't the major that's doing it you know like (laughs) so like for me like i think that like and they do they definitely put effort into trying to avoid disclosing that information like they're like the yeah. whole again we're you know the whole thing with him at that in with that that sassy man you know like yeah, yeah. the way that they work that they they dance around it being like oh well this the reason that the that the the sheriff who ends up being you know obviously the reveal here um yeah. isn't getting his messages is because this guy is just being a dick and so they yeah. have these like cool little little tricks up their sleeve to try to like make it clear that oh it's not the sheriff but like at the end of the day like all signs still point to it like he's leaving at such a strategic he goes, time he goes he's like going on his trip, trip. <laughs> yeah <laughs> like i mean like you we can't get a clear idea if he's actually there like i mean yeah. but they do do a really good job they throw in all these different random characters kind of swirling around in the storyline that it could be this person it could be this person this is lending to a motivation again that whole idea of like that that escape convict or whatever it is that's heading in their direction keeps coming into play, which is definitely trying to distract yours, the viewer's attention away from it. But I do think like if you're really following the heartbeat of the story, why would they open on Rosemary's letter with that very dramatic monologue? If, very <laughs> dramatic. And if it wasn't going to be the focus. From, like, something else, right? like the beginning. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, they, they give it their all though. They give it their yeah. all. And up through the, 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 the end, and you know, even beyond the reveal, like I'm fine with the reveal. And he gets a gnarly ass kill. And, yeah, you know, absolutely. and like, good on her. <laughs> yeah. For, um, but, you know, and then you've got this whole final moment. I'm curious, because this is one thing that always comes up when talking the Prowler is like this final moment of Pam coming back to the the, oh. the dorm and everything and you know having this whole moment where it, it seems like the body is is you know jumps up at her for a moment um and it feels very disjointed and very like removed from the tone of the rest of the film which is not at all fantastical you know how did that moment hit you how do you feel about that i'm curious um i don't i think it does feel too far removed from what the movie is already is it, it feels like they wanted their like carry moment uh, yeah. at the end to like oh, kind of yeah. shock the uh, shock people when they see it yeah. and um i kind of don't love that it ends on that note i mean i get it i mean it's a horror movie and like it probably was cool to have like a nice little singer at the end um right. but it does feel so far removed from everything else i mean like i mean i know they're trying to play up to that it be like an hallucination like whatever like it's fine but like the fact that it just ends on that um and, you know because you know the movie plays in a pretty uh realistic playing field for up until that point so like yeah. that's that threw that threw me off a bit and, and no matter how many times i've seen it i've always found it to be off i mean like it's it's fun watching it with a group of people who don't know that's coming and right uh, and of course uh, uh the actor with the you know eyes all whited out is a freaky image so like if you watch it with the right group of people it it freaks them out a little bit but like right. as a film it like it's the only thing about the movie that i think like doesn't work and it just feels like it was thrown in there as a like let's shock him one last time and this is all we got left because clearly the person who been doing all this he his head's been blown off so that he's gone so we only have one other thing that could possibly scare the audience um right. i mean I prob- maybe it did work for the people that did see it back then and people that right. continue to watch it now but i don't really particularly love it but what about you how do you feel about it you know, I, I I could do without it. I don't. I, you know, it's it's more than anything. It's just I just don't think it needs it. Like you end on that amazing head explosion, you know, and like Pam has this moment where she's done the job. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and 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 so there's some great closure in that. I think I get. I understand in the sense of coming full circle because there was that whole moment earlier of her avoiding opening the door avoiding opening the door i do like the idea that she comes back and she finally opens the door but the whole thing like the hallucination aspect again like this film 
thrives in its simplicity. It thrives in the fact that it's not an overly convoluted storyline at its core. And so to suddenly out of nowhere throw anything fantastical, it's just jarring, you know? And yeah. even though it is very much like dreamy and hazy and like a dream sequence in its own right, uh, hallucination, I just, I didn't need to go there, you know? But yeah. it's, I don't despise it. I love the visual. If anything, I guess it yeah. just maybe only, it almost cheapens the visual out for me a little bit because the scene, the actual kill itself is so good. I think they knew. I think they're like, yeah. we got to show more of it. Bring that back. <laughs> you know? yeah. Bring it back. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. okay, yeah. like, I'll check yeah. it out one more time. I won't complain. But yeah, I don't think it really needed that moment overall. Yeah. I also like that the movie doesn't take place over like an extended long period of time too. I mean, like that, it's like a very isolated yeah. event and uh you know and the fact that you know when they announce that like well the dance is going on that oh, there is a problem they have they have word of the prowlers on the loose and they're basically trying to contain right. uh that i love that i love that it's not over a matter of days it's just after this one night this one like event and uh that works in its favor too because you know it makes it even more simplistic in a really good way yeah. that we're not ju jumping from like other than you know jumping from like back in 1945 to present day like we're not jumping around a matter of like days to tell the story like it's really and i like that aspect of it too um yeah and it keeps it a lot more simple yeah i, I think you know we're going to keep coming back to the pacing because that is one thing both these titles really share but like i think one thing where the pacing i don't mind it is really building off what you're just saying which like because this takes place over one night like truly one night for aside from the flashback when it takes its time, it feels almost as if it's in real time. Like you feel like right. when you are walking through those house or the houses or those buildings or like those different settings and you're wandering through those environments because you also get it with a cemetery too. Like that right. cemetery, like, I mean, like it takes them about 35 minutes to get to that, that grave, but it's just this drawn out, like long, just like long winded sequence, but it really does add to that feeling of like i'm almost feeling like i'm there like you're getting the full scope of these big environments that house it's like right. a mansion that cemetery they really play up the depth of all the different gravestones then there's that whole moment of pam sitting in the vehicle and you know something's got to give they just they draw it out and they draw it out and they draw it out but it feels like you're just experiencing it in real time because of that fact that it is all over one night. And that's one thing my co-host Troy prefers, he always says he prefers a slasher that takes place over one night because as soon as you start yeah. to draw it out over multiple days, there's more and more like options for like the police getting involved or finding a resolution. There's something about the desperation of having right. to survive something you don't understand. And in this film, the lead characters, Pam and Mark, don't even know what exactly is going on. They're piecing oh, exactly. it together. <laughs> as yeah. it's happening and that does add to the the suspense factor because you're right there with them you're right. in their you're in the same shoes experiencing it beat for beat and that's why i think i don't mind that and then that like i said that's something that this and the strangers very much have in common is there are moments that you feel like you are in that environment with them yeah i also like in the case of both those movies just bringing them up is that every like shot that is building tension or suspense feels like it has purpose like there's not like a wasted like moment of those shots, yeah. so that's why I don't mind a slow burn. If like you know, hey, you're building if you're building it like and building to something that is gonna be pretty big, yeah. and like every and, like most of the shots that take place at night. Like I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that. Like the ending itself, like like of course feels like it's an hallucination, it's dreamlike, but the whole movie feels that way. The way it's shot looks like a little ethereal a bit, a bit. Like it doesn't feel like it's in a real time or space. And right. that kind of gives it a bit of its uh, style and atmosphere too. Yeah. But yeah. Almost every shot like lingers in a way that matters. Like, I feel like there's not like, as far as building suspense, like yeah. there's not a moment that's wasted. And I, I appreciate that aspect of it too. You're hitting on all the same like notes I have. I was like, I wasn't sure. I was gonna be up. I was gonna be like, oh, I have to defend the prowler. But like, we're on the very much the same note. I'm curious, just because this isn't. I mean, obviously, we're not reviewing this movie, but it's just it's like out of left field. I'm gonna throw it at you. Um, have you ever seen uh, 2015, The Invitation by Karen Kasuma? Yeah, I love that movie. It's yeah. really good. Yeah. Exact. Yeah. Exactly falls within the category. Perfect example of another film that. Does, like you're saying, you're talking like every shot makes sense. Every shot is intentional. Like the craftsmanship yeah. of that movie as well. Every shot is intended to build that unsettling sense of just simmering, building dread over this elongated period of time. It's one night, 
oftentimes you feel like you're right there in that same house with all these characters. It's one environment, pretty much the whole movie, but you're right in the middle of it. And that's, I think that's an even more modern example of, of, you know, what we're talking about films that really intentionally take the slow burn approach. And these are all films that really fall, that all take place over around a 24 hour period of time, right. you know? Right. Yeah. And it's crazy too. Cause like while you're watching it, like when you watch a movie that takes place just on a night, whether it's, uh, you know, something like Halloween, which is like for the, from the beginning of the day to the end of the night. Uh, and then something like Strangers which is just one night. And then, then something like this. Uh, when I'm watching movies like that, I kind of wonder how, like, how much time that I would have in order to get out of that uh, similar right. situation. Like, right. you know, when I, when I first saw The Strangers, I was like, okay, this can't, like, thinking to myself, like, how much night do we have left? Like, is there enough time for, like, to, as soon as it's daylight, you know, we should be good, right? Uh, so you start thinking those things, like you know how what how much time would I have to get out of that situation? It makes it more dire than when it's yeah. in one night. Uh, and I'm not saying that you can't like those movies can't work over a matter of days, right? I mean, like uh, it can work, but I think that uh, you made a good point. Like once you ha once you have multiple days, then then you have more authority figures that have to be involved in the plot of like what's going on because you can't have a murder spree that goes on for a week and have no cops to be involved in it whatsoever. Right. Um, so I, I do like that aspect of like a lot of those projects being like, it's just what's, you know, almost like a single space, either a single location and a short amount of time. Cause like, you're kind of on that clock with them as well. And I, yeah. yeah, works in their favor. Oh yeah. I mean like, I, and, and not to like completely segue into the strangers, but like, you know, one thing that works so well with The Strangers is how few people are even clued into what's happening in general. Like, right. I mean, you know, over the course of The Prowler, like, obviously there is somewhat of a police presence because they're tracking this other Prowler that they think has been going from campus to camp, or like, you know, traveling right. across, uh, heading in that direction. Uh, so they're, they're, they've got, they've already got like their senses, uh, right. their focus is, is placed on like something might be heading this way. We have to be oh, alert. They're announcing it, the school at the dance, they're telling everyone that they have to go home. There's a prowler on the loose. So, you know, there's right. already an, an awareness of what's going on. You know, with with um, the strangers, the only people that really have a fucking idea about what's going on is the people that are in immediate danger. And the only other person that finds out anything is Glenn Howerton from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> and he Always dies with his- in seconds. I mean, he's dead yeah. within seconds. So, like, there's no yeah. hope for help. And I think that's what really makes The Strangers such a standout. And, and again, really b builds upon that slow burn, you know, we keep talking about, it, but this is really, I think, is the focus of, of what we're discussing is, like, when slow burn works and it's intentional, that. It's it's an it's an elevated experience. It's I think it's refined horror. It's not just depending on the gore. Prowler has some amazing gore. The Strangers yeah. has some very brutal, violent sequences, but it's also very intentional about how it uses the slow moments to build upon those moments. So when they do happen, they hit so much harder. Yeah, agree. Um, I you know I'm glad you pointed that out to you because like so some of the reviews I read for the Prowler talked about how you know at that time you know they. When this, I mean, the slasher film was like really emerging during this time. So a lot of reviews that were very negative commented on how nasty it was and how violent it was and how gory it was. And it's just crazy to me, like to, to miss the point of like, yeah, that that is there, but it's not like raining blood the entire movie. There's like it slows down enough to take a beat to do other things and to build suspense. Um, uh, so I kind of that kind of think it sucks that at least back then it was labeled as like. You know, just a generic kind of gore fest. I like I know like in the years in recent years it's kind of been reappraised. Like they think it's one of the better uh slasher movies to come out during that era. Uh you know, more so than stuff like Prom Night or Terror Train or any of that. Um because of like the uh you know the way that Tom Savini utilizes gore effects, but the way the movie is shot, it doesn't really like again, it feels like it's a bit more than some of those films that were coming out at that time. Um so I'm glad that it kind of has like the recognition it deserves a bit today, but it is like, you know, a lot of these movies that are coming out back then. Like they were all kind of viewed as like, you know, they're just nasty and gross and they're mean spirited. Like you see that a lot in some of the reviews that are coming out. And this is one of them where they kind of uh, just kind of threw that out there. A lot of the critics like just hated it. And it just, I, it's crazy. Like I, I, I don't know what my sensibilities would have been if I was an adult in 1981 or like, watching stuff like this. Now you're just like, that's crazy that they don't see that it's more than just like, 
you know, severed fucking limbs and impalements and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like The Prowler is a film that when it comes to, like, the story and the motivations behind, like, what's happening, like, I feel like it takes even a little more care. It's a little more nuanced than a lot yeah. of what we get. Like, you know, like, it's definitely... To me, I, th I think the motivation behind the killer is significantly more... Um, I'm not going to say, like, in a, sympathetic or anything like that, but, like, that kind of grudge, that that kind of, like, scorned lover grudge, like, you yeah. see that painted all over true crime all the freaking time. All the time, yeah. Like, these things happen. People operate that way. You know, that is a motivation I buy it. Something like this triggering that kind of response out of someone who obviously snapped and did something really horrible years ago and now this dance is coming back into play and it's triggering this individual's memories to the point that that he snaps and acts upon it i can buy that way more than some of these way more convoluted films that were coming out where you find out that the killer is the relative of somebody that was affiliated with the original murder but it's not like yeah. directly like you know like it's like there's all these like strings and you have to piece together like oh i guess like i guess that makes sense to me like why that person was killing them we just covered here's a perfect example this is a modern movie but this is a film that was a really i thought a great film but it, it, the ending kind of petered out for me um the the remake of town that dreaded sundown Oh, okay. Yeah, I've seen it. I thought it was a great film. I thought it was really, really well done. A lot of pre police procedural, but like it comes down to the final reveal. And I really felt like after all of this progress and all of this storyline, it's, it's a pretty intelligent film. It feels like the two characters, they just like were like, okay, we pick these two, and these two yeah. characters are going to be the killer. Like, and, I, I like, and I feel like they got barely any time to explain their motivation, and then they're dead, and like the movie's over. Yeah. This film, like, the the motivation for the killer is the through story. Like, it right. is the heartbeat of the film. That anger, that resentment. Like, when you figure it out what's happening, you go back and you watch through it again. You're like, okay, this is a, a tale of vengeance. It is a tale of someone who is very scorned. And they're pissed off because they're being forced to basically confront and remember their demons. I, I buy it. I buy it. I think that this film is extremely like nuanced and really a, a, a solid script from beginning to end. I really enjoy this film. Yeah, and that's the core of it too. I mean, like you hear about those kind of stories a lot, where you know people go away to fight for their country, they're married, and then they find out, you know, while they were gone, their wife, girlfriend, fiance, whatever, you know, she didn't know them while they were gone. Because like you know, because that on that other end of it too, there there is some a lot of stuff for that too. Like you know, mm -hmm. you're being left alone and like. You know you're lonely whatever but then you have the you know that other person involved who's like i've been doing this great thing like you knew what you were getting into when you you know got with me this is what yeah. you signed up for and so like the core of that story is very realistic and yeah. very you know that you know yeah not everyone's gonna snap the way that this guy snaps but like it is it's very like believable right that that would happen and that you know you know this this person would have this like deep love for this for this woman and then and then that betrayal would like make him lose it right um, and then because of the circumstances that he's also involved in like he's away at war too so there's there's all those implications that they don't really go into that are like right people like like how we think about him like oh like there's a whole other reason why he could have flipped his lid on top of that yeah but, but yeah that's a great point and like i mean when i was saying nuances earlier like i mean truthfully I say nuances because they don't smear you with like there's mental illness at play like the, right. they hint at like it is very reasonable for me as a viewer to, to put together that this man experienced some horrible things when he was right. away at war and then he came home realizing that he had been left by his you know his lover and and left for another man and like layer that all on top of it and that just adds to it but they don't go so deep into that that they're trying to explain like what the mental illness is or you know you're not seeing this guy have like big you know overdone portrayals of like schizophrenia or things right. like we've seen in other movies that were way less sensitive to mental illness there's a lot of movies that use it as a crutch and they're like right. this is the reason that this guy is doing what he's doing this is why he's killing this film it's hinted that there's elements of PTSD. It would make complete sense after what this character went through. And something like this would absolutely trigger something in that person. Face, right. again, face, this dance coming back into play, these memories coming back up. 
I get, I completely buy it because, you know, they've, they've given me the blueprint. They've given me enough information as a viewer without sh like smothering me with it. And I respect that about this film because a lot less classy films, you right. take mental illness and they just throw it at the audience and they give you some caricature depiction of what they think mental illness is. And it, it's so overdone. It's so unrealistic. It feels so fake that if anything, it just comes off feeling like tacky or offensive. This doesn't feel that way for me. Exactly. And I know I mentioned Prom Night before, but there, there's a lot, of, there's some similarities between the two where you have like this event that happened a long time ago. And then, you know, we, of course, we learn later that, you know, it's the, you know, the brother and he, like, you know, saw, he saw his sister and you know, they played that prank on her and, and like that game at the beginning and she dies. And then, of course, you have another event, which is prom, but the prom doesn't really play into what happened in the past. It's just like now he's old enough to exact said revenge on these people. And then that movie also throws in the red herring of like I think someone who's like escaped and they think it might be like on his way to do some stuff there. Like I was like, you know, they are two movies doing similar things, and I do feel some sympathy for the brother character in Prom Night, I guess, uh, for what he had to see and endure. But like, um, it's handled in a much more like that feels much. That movie feels more like a like exploitation kind of slasher movie, even though it does have like a that element of like, oh, there was just this event that kind of made him snap and he wants to get vengeance for his deceased sister. But like, um, th I think this one handles that kind of situation a bit better, probably because it's not totally heavy handed. Like it's just, you know, it like you, you, the information that you get, like you as a person knows like, oh, that is what that would make a lot of people not necessarily do these kind of things, but it would definitely make them, uh emotional whatever that whatever the case may be so you understand it um a bit and i'm also glad too that it's uh we don't have uh because the movie could have done that they could have easily made uh pam some kind of like it could have been some real relation to what happened like a long time ago there could have been like a deeper connection there as well uh when my friends watch it they're waiting for that <laughs> when they're watching right. it they're like they're like oh like uh sister so-and-so whatever like they're waiting for like this big kind of moment to uh spring up and i love that it's just kind of like like you said like that for her her situation she's like oops like wrong place wrong time <laughs> kind of thing right. and, and she's just thrown in the middle of this like kind of uh now this revenge fantasy was going to happen either way no matter if she was involved or her friends were involved like whoever was setting this dance up again that's who it was going to happen to it doesn't matter who it was and i actually like that they don't try to make any force like kind of like connections between like the new characters that we get introduced, like the main like core uh, right. to make that work. This is a film that like, while I'm a huge fan of it, I, I feel like it, it, it is better off because it's not followed up by a sequel. You know, it's a, one of the few slasher titles at this point that does not have a, a sequel. And, and for me, like, I don't think, I think anything beyond what we got here would feel forced, you know, like I yeah. think they'd be really trying to force a story out of it. Um, and I just don't think it needs that. Like as a standalone piece, like this this film again, it delivers so many things that I don't think I need to have like a second, like a retreading of it. Like you know, the killer, the outcome of the killer. Like there's no reason necessarily to build off that motivation because it's so yep. personalized and intentional. And we get so many amazing sequences with that killer, so many amazing visuals. Like, I don't know if there's anything more I need from him. You know, like yep. the moments I have with him, like he is. Truly, I think one of the most impressive slasher killers yeah. it, overall, in my opinion. Like, I think when he does what he needs to do, he does it just as good, if not better, than all of the ones that we celebrate on a daily basis. And people wearing t-shirts when they're going to conventions and we're buying yeah. box sets and all of that. Like this, in this one movie, I think this killer creates an aesthetic and, and a visual and, and just a really brutal, like, unsympathetic form of violence that um a lot of movies don't have that like there's this movie is pretty aside from like witty banter between like the, the younger characters this is a film that's like void of humor this killer yeah. is completely dry like this is not like a freddy krueger this is not an emotional killer really like you would get with like a leather face who's having breakdowns like when this killer yeah. is killing he is stoic and that is what makes it work and like when he kills it is very like very matter sharp and rigid and matter of fact like you would expect yeah. from someone who was you know in the military like he kills like it like i buy it uh and these are all strengths that i think really make this movie like just a standout and deserves that and you know uh, 
modern eye analysis. A lot of younger viewers, like they might think that they're going to get bored with it, but I assure you, like you watch this in the right room on the right TV with a freaking good sound system, like yeah. the score here, the it audio. Takes... I mean, come on, it, it's it so good. Definitely does. Definitely does. Yeah. Um, I I was going to ask you because you did mention the aspect of a sequel. Do you think uh, is there any? Because it reminded me of My Bloody Valentine, which was remade eventually, right. and that and that remake wasn't horrible. It was actually I thought it was. I haven't watched it in a while, but if I remember, it's pretty good. Yeah. Do you think there is a space or a world where like they could remake this and it would work uh, today? I think you know. I think the thing that like comes into play is like we're in such a PC culture. In some ways, that's awesome. In other ways, I think that stunts certain things with any genre in general. But like you know, with horror, like something like this, like. If they tried to set it in present day, like, and they tried to like tap into a military angle of, of like what's going on with, with PTSD and how much more sensitive we are to it, like I think they would have to, I mean, it would have to be handled in a very delicate way and they would probably yeah. have to make some changes. Um, you know, as somebody who like, as someone who had like, is treated for like mental illness, like I'll just say it, I'm not offended. So like, I'm kind of no. like, bring it on. I'm like, cool. Like, I want to see what you do with it. If anything, like, as long as you don't try to make it again, a caricature. Right. I, I would be interested in watching that movie because again, the visual here is phenomenal. I think like if they handle it the right way, it could almost feel like what they did with the Hills have eyes. When they yeah. redid the Hills have eyes, they stayed very true to the source material. They just went 10 times harder harder <laughs> they just amped it up yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and like yeah, give me yeah. that you know give yeah. me give me that with the prowler because like you've got a scary freaking killer like you don't really have to change anything about the aesthetic just like i don't know you could re remake it and just set it in the same era i'm curious to see what they would do maybe tie yeah. up a few of the loose ends but like i i don't know i think the thing is is like I don't need it. There's other films where I'd be like, I really would die to see a remake just to see what they would change with this. Like, aside again from maybe a little bit of that pacing, adding a little bit more meat to the bone to kind of maybe give some some closure around a few other subplots. Right. Aside from that, I wouldn't change a ton about this film. And I yeah. also think like the gore, like they're just going to be trying to outdo what's already done. So like challenge accepted. Like I'd be curious to see what they can do. But like, I feel like for the most part, I'd probably be like, eh, like that looks cool, but like still like the original looked better. Like I can't imagine yeah. it being much better than that, you know? So like, I don't know. I'm kind of on the fence with it. What about you? Um, I'm on the fence too. I, I, and I agree. They would have to be really delicate and sensitive if they did play up the whole, uh, the war angle too with the story. Yeah. Um, I think, and it's for, and the benefit of it is a lot of people don't know about it. So there'd be right. room for them to like, if they wanted to make little improvements here and there, they can. Right. Uh, right. Without offending too many people, of course, right. like people like you and I who've seen it will notice how much they would change if they did change a lot. Yeah, um, it, it you know I also kind of fear if they did try to remake it, then they might go the route route of like remaking it in name only and changing like everything about it. And you know yeah. we've seen that happen before too. Like you know like they did that with Prom Night, that was a remake in name only. <laughs> it didn't have anything to do with like the original. Right. Um, and uh, you know they when they remade Black Christmas the second time. Uh, that was <laughs> that, that, that was Don't. also a remake, a remake in name. You know, dude, I never oh. thought I never thought I would get to a place because I love the original Black Christmas, right? So when I saw the first remake, I was like, "This is awful," but it's everything that that movie's not. It's not atmospheric. It's not suspenseful. It's just right. gory and stupid. But right. then over time, I was like, "The characters are fun." Yes, I can have a good time with it now. Yes. but that second one, there's like oh. nothing about it. That is, is remotely fun. All right, yeah, it's oh. Uh, listen, I I'm not. You'll get a full other three podcasts out of me just talking about that, that second remake. But I will say, like, you know, we've we've covered we've we have not covered the 2019 one yet. It's coming, um, but it is noted as my one of my top two least favorite horror movies of all time. And I am Black Christmas is like sacred That's to one. me. Yeah, I love and, it. Personally, I think, you know, after, you know, at first when I saw the first remake, I was taken aback. But you know what I got to say about that first remake? And I won't go off on a tangent. At least they did their fucking homework. Like, you know, the choices yeah. they made, the development of the backstory for Billy, yeah. they knew, at least they went into that knowing the core story of what made the original film tick. And they're like, we're just going to make it pure popcorn fodder, but we're still going to do our homework. 
I refuse to even acknowledge yeah. the other one because they just literally like, let's take this name, let's add a tar cult, <laughs> statues crying tar, and like yeah. I things I don't need from Black Christmas. All I need the most basic slasher, the simpler the better. Much. Yeah, yeah. I'm still <laughs> angry about that. I'm still angry about it. I, like, you know, because like, yeah, because I honestly think there is a good re like. I mean, I can appreciate the uh, the first one, uh, yeah. the first remake for what it is now. But yeah. I actually think there is a good remake there. Like, you know, that could be really well done today. Yeah, if they just did like, you know, it's it's all the stuff you need is like there already. I, I do love yeah. like I yeah you know, we covered it last year. My co-host had never seen it before ever, and he uh, fell in love with the original after we mm -hmm. watched it, and that was great. And I'm glad that people are still discovering it. Um, but yeah, dude, that that last one, that re remake in name only, it was horrible. And I kind of think if they did do, if they didn't want to like touch on some of the like stuff from the original Prowler, that they would try to do that. They yeah. didn't just, you know, they would just like, here's the name. We'll just we'll take that and then run with something else. Yeah, and that would be my concern uh, when yeah. remaking it. If they thought it'd be too like not difficult to like do the same story, but uh, even though it's a horror film, I do agree with you that they would have to be delicate with how they did that if they kept it in modern day like yeah. if they're they talking about you know uh more current war that someone's coming back from like how that would you know there's a lot of implications there that um that you might not want to like uh exploit for a horror movie i guess but you know yeah i agree on that i think like if they were going to do it at all and i i just mentioned this film but i actually think this angle would probably work for it is again the town that dreaded sundown the reboot where it treated it like a, you know, it acknowledged the original film, yeah. and then it, it, but it was talking about the killings because you know the original film is based off real murders, and so that was the through the through story is how the creation of the '70s film impacted this town and who would be out for vengeance because of it. I almost yeah. feel like they would have to visit it as saying like the original film, it make it make it a sequel. But don't make like you know, don't make it like the grandson of the man. Like yeah, exactly. you know, tap into it as someone like obsessed with it, with, with what happened. So or you know, have it be somebody who's connected through a completely different uh, aspect, um, and make their intentions for for revitalizing these murders like completely of their own regard, and just don't like take it over the top. That's that's again, that's what works with the prowler. Like while the kills yeah. are wild. The motivation's not over the top. I buy oh, it. So it yeah. would have to be something that I could, like, I could see the the outcome and say, oh, okay, like that. I get. I buy it. I, it makes right. sense to me why that person did what they did. You know. Exactly. Um, before we wrap here, up here, I want to ask you just a couple of things. I know. I know you didn't pick the strangers overall. You picked the prowler. But I wanted to right. ask you from when you first saw the strangers, and then when you saw the sequel, because the first uh, original stranger is way more like atmospheric and. Uh, uh, based more on tension and suspense, while the Prey at Night seems like it's more of a slasher movie uh, right. than the original. Yeah. Um, what did you think of those uh, going from The Strangers to that? And then if you have seen Chapter 1, what were your thoughts on uh, them doing that as well? So, uh, you know, I, uh, Prey at Night, I, I enjoyed it immensely, but I enjoyed it as I do a lot of, like, of the glossier like, you know, popcorn slashers. I use that term yeah. a lot. Like, you know, you go in, you're having a good time. Like, Pray at Night was a great slasher, but it felt like a heightened reality. You know, it felt like yeah. from the locations, like there's, you know, it's the things you always say you're going to get in a sequel. Uh, yeah. It almost feels like the scream formula, you know, bigger locations, yeah. higher body count, um, you know, like more shocking revelations and scenarios. Like this time, it's two parents and their children. Like, you know, and it yeah. just felt like it felt just a little more elevated which is a good thing but the thing about the original movie that for me is so impactful is just it is literally they say in the movie it's because these people because they're there because they're home yeah. and it's just this couple who is so vulnerable because they are going through a very personal decline of their relationship she yeah. declined a proposal Scott Speedman is is not dealing with it well at all. He's coping. She's processing Liv Tyler in one of like I mean her best roles ever, showing so much emotion. And yeah. all of these moments are given so much time to breathe. And yeah. in the first movie, the moments that I think are the strongest are the moments that are the uh, just the most 
basic, realistic, believable scenarios. She's in this rural house. She doesn't lock the sliding door. He walks in and stands behind her and watches her and goes yeah. into the house. The whole time, I know that this fucker can get in the house. Yeah, like yeah. me, as the audience, this poor woman going through all of her feelings, coping, you know, yeah. uh, drinking, like uh, as you would do, and not even suspecting for a majority of the film that, that there's even anyone around. And so they really just they lean in to these natural, simple, realistic scenarios. Whereas with with the second film, as you would with any sequel, you're looking to outdo it. But as soon as you're trying to outdo it, you're making these situations bigger. You're trying to surprise the audience. You're trying to add factors or elements that are going to throw them off. And so as soon as you enter that territory of trying to outdo what came before it, it's feeling more and more void of reality or oftentimes right. is the case and i do think like with prey at night while it's a fantastic slasher and i think it's great and i think it's a wonderful follow-up it's so different from the first movie and it does feel so much glossier and so much just trying so much harder to be a slasher that it just doesn't hit me quite as hard as the strangers hits me when i watched the strangers the first time it took my breath away the yeah. conclusion for that movie, because there's there's really not much of a body count, but the people that die, like by the end of it, you are you're gutted. You yeah. are gutted because these poor fucking people and those little Jehovah's Witness children <laughs> yeah, riding yeah. up, or more, I'm sorry, Mormon boys riding up and finding that massacre. Poor Liv Tyler gutted on the floor. Like you know, it's just. It just it, it really leaned into the simplicity, which I do think is a great parallel between these two films. They right. they take so much time. Slow burn has been the word, the phrase of this this review, and I think that these are two films that mostly use that to their advantage. And I do think that The Strangers is is from beginning to end uh, just a little bit more successful in with the pacing. Like when it does pace it and it's slow, it pays off every time. There are yeah. a few moments in in prowler that do not provide a payoff that make you as the viewer feel a little like oh like i was really expecting something bigger so yeah. i do think that the strangers is more successful with that um by a hair by a hair and i don't think that the, the strangers pray at night needed that so much because it decided its trope was going to be higher body count more yeah. violent kills glossier bigger locations you know you're at this hotel and everything you've got the pool sequence um, yeah, which people love. Yeah. I mean, I, and, but it, but that's like the you know that it's proof of like a bigger thing compared yeah. to like anything in the first movie. Right. Uh, it's a fun moment, but like it definitely yeah. is more like elevated than everything yes. else. And then like you know with chapter one, I didn't understand that so much. I still don't really understand it. Um, I, I I I will I will say when when I had to when I went to a press screen for it and we were reading through press notes, they had all these quotes from like Winnie Winnie Harlan about like it's not a sequel, it's not a reboot, like saying what it wasn't and i was like well then what is it when we were when i was watching it because it was it was just like there's a lot of stuff that's in that from that first movie um i don't know what the point of it still is i watched it again trying to figure out the point and um i i'm still like baffled by its existence and I'm, i'll try to give you know the next chapter a shot and hopefully it's way different because like it won't have to be it won't have to be so connected to the strangers i guess like because i think what they were trying i think they were trying to play it safe by being like hey it's this new thing but like we're gonna have elements of that old thing that you like just in case you're not really into this new thing <laughs> um, yeah yeah i didn't know what it, what to do really or it was trying to play it was trying to play both sides of that I think out of all three of these films, you know, from the original Strangers to Pray at Night to Chapter One, like, you, they're feeling more and more studio produced. And by the time yeah. you get to Chapter One, like, it is very much recreating a lot of the classic moments, like the reflection shot of him sitting in the chair and everything. Yeah. It's recreating a lot of those things, but it's doing it through such a glossy lens, such like a highly, like, overproduced lens that, like, Really, what makes the original Strangers work is like the shakiness of the camera, the racking focus, like these long lingering shots, but there's like a grittiness to it, like the close ups of the hands, like fumbling with glasses and stuff. Like, you know, there's a lot of commotion to the yeah. way they film it. And I felt like there was just a glossification to an extreme with chapter one. But I think also, like, there's something to be said about the outcome of the original movie, the stakes are high because. Yeah. All three of these fuckers are still out there 
And you're left, I mean, like, you know that these two people are dead. You know you have this random scare moment with her, but, like, ain't yeah. no way that poor woman's making it, yeah, she's, making she's it gone. out of that. She's gone. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. I love Liv, Ty- Liv Tyler's welcome in my house any time. But, like, I mean, she's not making it out of that movie alive. And then by the time you get to this new movie, like, it's very much intended to, like, approach this as an ongoing series for obvious studio reasons. Like, the right. reason they want to do that is because they can continue to make money off of this franchise. Um, and so the stakes don't feel as high. And even in Prey at Night, like, I I like that these, these fuckers are human, but they are human beings. And, you know, once you start to see them get killed off in that sequel yeah. and see how vulnerable they are, um, there's a fear element that's that's removed. Whereas, again, Thanks the first the movie, you're, they're so taken by surprise, they really are not... They're not prepared... The, the couple is not prepared to defend themselves. They sure try... But when there's three against two and eventually three against one, I mean, what are you going to do, you know? Um, And I feel like progressively each film, you know, from Prey at Night to to Chapter One, the the stakes feel lowered. The threat feels lesser. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I I think by the time you got to the new one, I I don't know anybody that walked out of Chapter One feeling like this is my favorite take on (laughs) this formula. Like, I don't think anyone was was in, as entranced with what is her name a metal what uh, she's from Riverdale I always forget her Riverdale last girl the red the red puffy like, lips she was, she was fine like she was fine know. but you know she they cast her just because she got those puffy lips that look like <laughs> Liv Tyler's puffy lips and like she's a beautiful girl but yeah. you know all I see is those lips and I just feel like even this feels like she's a, she's she's just a little bit glossier she's prettier she's got that like that Hollywoodification that the original film felt was kind of stripped away from it. And so yeah. I don't need this series to feel... I feel like they did that with her and the bigger. boyfriend, like, and the guy who they cast as her boyfriend. Yeah. Like, it's just like, it really just, like, they just wanted to... They feel like they need to amp it up. And yeah. and I know and I know that's what he pitched them on, was this, like, you know, this multiple story thing. And right. Lionsgate was like, sure, because... We need money, yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah. we can make it, and we can make it on the cheap, and let's film them back to back. I mean, it, I get the intention behind it. It was just like, oh, yeah. I weird. don't know, man. I feel like, I mean, what? How? I think with this whole thing of like the retcon, or like you know, even I, and I'll say this right now, like the the one that really set off this new approach of like like t- let's tap into the material and let's make it impossible to tell if it is it in the same universe. Or is it its own thing? It's it's it was when Halloween did this, you know, when Halloween yeah. took that approach, and like everyone was so behind it with Halloween 2018. I was not. I will say that I was never <laughs> a oh, fan. Oh, you never. Um, <laughs> so by the time we had the lady with the, the Iron Woman, you know, coming out, whatever, uh, and like by the second movie, and then we hit the third movie, I was like, I told you all, like mm-hmm. this was a, this is this is like a, this is not going to go well, you know, and so I think that at this point, the retcon, we've seen this, this idea is trying to run its course, and I think that The Strangers Chapter 1 has kind of coming at the tail end of like this approach to this material, so I really, I don't see the next entry like doing gangbusters and if there's another one after that i think it'll probably even do worse unless they completely reconfigure what they're going to do you know exactly i think the one uh you know when they brought back scream i I was glad that they didn't completely retcon their stuff they they just tried to they just added new people and then like had the legacy characters there now who knows what they're going to do with seven if they're going to be like disregard what happened in five and six or whatever but i'm glad that so far they were like no like this is all one connected universe. That was yeah. my issue. Even though with Halloween 2018, I think I was just so happy to have like a good Halloween movie out right. Right. at the time. Right. And it was cool that it was cool to see it all back. But I'm not a big fan of the red cotton either because you know disregarding those those movies right. is a is a slap in the face to the other I mean, I know Jamie Lee Curtis was in some of those movies that are were right. disregarded. But like, you know, it's a, it's still like a slap in the face to the people that made those other movies, like, oh, those aren't important. <laughs> to like you know what we're doing and and right. especially if you're not gonna like really uh yeah pay off on that because i like you just said when you're like i told you guys by the time halloween kills and ends came out like so i loved halloween 2018 when kills came out um i my friends were like see this is why they should have done this and then when ends came out and then it was like yeah exactly this is why they yeah. shouldn't have done this so yeah yeah 
Yeah, right. I'm not going to go off on this tangent. I'm yeah, just going to yeah. say it because I have to because I got to defend it. But like, yeah. I am I am a diehard fan of Halloween too, and I know people are like it's boring. But listen, here's the deal: I am a fan of a sequel that picks up right after the end of the last film. Like, I give them credit for getting creative and just continuing that storyline. Sure, the yes. wig is bad, but you know what else? <laughs> that hospital's terrifying, and she's yeah. sedated through the whole thing. And like, nothing scarier to me than being sedated with a broken leg being chased by a killer. And so for me, like, you know, you're talking about like the slap in the face. For me as a fan, some people are a fan of the Michael Myers sibling outcome, some are not. But that is not far enough in the deconstruction of the Halloween franchise that I think it's a valid point to just remove that and be like, none of this happened. Only what happened here is relevant. But then to go back in and go back to Haddonfield Memorial Hospital, the same hospital from Halloween 2, bringing yeah. all these other elements into play that it's like, honestly, making Michael the sibling in 2018 would have given me as the viewer a lot more like dedication to the product because right now like watching 2018 if i go back and watch that i don't think michael gives a fuck about Lori Stroh. he no, doesn't I care don't. about her at all like and, 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 I think, and, I, and i think by kills they kind of make that a point they're like yo i don't think this is about you i think he's just trying to get home like i want it to be about her like give me yeah. h2o any day of the week yeah. like any day so yeah that's yeah. my argument that's yeah. another episode i won't yeah, i, I won't talk to you off <laughs> i agree with you man i mean and then of course to disregard it and then basically do the same thing in kills by like oh she's in the hospital oh she's sidelined for a whole movie it's like this <sighs> like we're gonna ignore that but yeah i know i could talk to you all day about that kind of stuff, man. oh my god uh, <laughs> that's hilarious uh and the last thing i want to do with you uh we always uh grade the movies at the end uh so however you want to grade the prowler or if you want to do like a letters letterbox uh one to one through five stars letter, letter grade yeah. one through ten whatever you want to do uh the floor is yours yeah uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do my, my letterbox re review uh, for Prowlers is four and a half stars. Um, my only gripe with it is that at times the pacing does get a little bit laggy and that, again, in turn prevents a few of the subplots to have a fully cohesive and complete conclusion. Overall, this film is top tier in, in so many aspects from how it's filmed to the elements that make it scary to you know, the gore, the costumes, the where they put the budget. This film is an example of someone who understands suspense, a filmmaker that understands how to direct tension, building drama. This is not a, a, a horror movie that I think is for in um, a uh, simple-minded film. <laughs> you know, some people yeah. are going to go looking for the gore and nothing more. I yeah. like to be challenged. I like to be forced to think a little bit. And I like to watch something where I can tell that people put real effort into what they're creating. And I think The Prowler is an example of a movie where every penny that was spent on it was was used wisely. And that that, that comes through clearly. So I gave it four and a half stars. Um, and I, I definitely encourage, like, you know, if there's for some reason a listener who has not seen The Prowler, who made it through this whole episode, that we've ruined the movie for you, um, go watch <laughs> it. Because, like, really, it is an example of a film that, though it is very 80s, there are not many films to this day that succeed in certain areas quite as well as this film does. And especially it's the gore, but it's also some of the execution, some of the cinematography. I really think it has some of the best horror sequences in the genre at least within the slasher genre exists within this film so yeah four and a half stars yep. out of five yep. yeah i'm gonna go i gave it four the last time i reviewed it i gotta look at it again but yeah i gave it a four and i think i'm still there with uh the four out of five and before anyone i know because i get i get messages sometimes with like oh you give that movie a four but like something yeah it's like you know this is all personal preference mm -hmm. uh you know and some of these movies are graded on a different curve than other movies like yeah. Also, you know, it's my letterbox. So whatever. Uh, and, and also, like, you want to give it four and a half out of five, you can. I am going to just echo everything that you said. It, it, it's 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 much better than uh, uh, than you would think it is. And even though it kind of is, I mean, I think it's great that it's at the beginning of that wave of snow slasher movies because it doesn't feel like a total, like, car carbon copy by the time you get to, like, you know, 1984 or 5, and we're like, you have a bunch of these out by then. Right. The fact that this was like in the beginning of it um, makes it stand out a bit more, and I'm glad that it's getting the recognition now that it deserves, and people have discovered it a bit more. Yeah. Um, I would love for someone to like 
to a 4K release of this. I don't know if that's possible or not. Oh, uh, my um, dream. <laughs> my dream. Uh, uh, like, I would love that. Um, not, not that I'm not happy with the Blu-ray I have, but I would love to, because uh, some of that cinematography would look so good. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. With them restoring it a bit. But yeah, I agree. It's, uh, it's, it's a really good slash movie, but it has a little bit more depth than uh, your typical slasher film. So I was, I mean, I know I went back and forth with you about which one you wanted to pick. And I'm actually glad that you even, you fit in, in the discussion talking about the strangers a little bit. So that yeah. worked out. Yeah. So you're like kind of talk about both, but yeah, it was such a good one to revisit and um, a good choice on your part. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy. Honestly, like I, when you mentioned the list of films, like you're like, you're like, here's some ones that we're kind of thinking of. It was a, such a good timing because, like I said, I had just watched it with a group of people and I came off of it with, like, fresh thoughts, you know, because I never really challenged my opinion on the movie before. But I can see, after watching with a group of people, I can see some of the issues people might have with it. But uh, I think at its core, it's, 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 it's really one of the strongest of the era. And I'm happy, you know, four stars, I think, is, is completely makes sense to me. Um, but I'm always interested to hear from people, too, who don't agree with me you know like if, yeah. if anyone wants to message me on social media and challenge all my thoughts like by all means just don't be like a dick about it that's all <laughs> yeah there you go that's all that's that's all we ask and uh, right. you know, we're, we're gonna i'm gonna link uh, all of uh, your stuff uh, at least for your podcast uh so they can uh, uh come check you out um let everyone know where they can uh find it i'm sure i'm assuming yeah. every, anywhere that you get your podcast and if there's anything that's coming up that you're excited about on your show that you want to uh, mention Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah. So Dark Knight, the podcast, um, we are normally weekly um, when we're feeling like it. It depends. It depends on how busy we are. Uh, but no, we're normally weekly. Um, and uh, you, all, you know, major streaming services, uh, but obviously like Apple Podcasts and, and you know, wherever you listen, you're going to find us. So uh, Dark Knight, yeah. the podcast, feel free to leave a five star, uh, but only after you leave a five star here. Um, and uh, other than that, on my social media platforms, I, I go by the Scream Queer. Um, so that tends to be my go to, like on Instagram. That's normally where I'm my most interactive. I'm also on X. Um, and then my film that I'm working on right now, Meet the Movie, is on Instagram as Meet the Movie. So feel free to follow that as well. We are um, getting ready for our local premiere here uh, around the new year. Uh, and then you'll be seeing a lot from that uh, in the film festival circuit as well. Uh, and that's the queer slasher, the queer theme slasher I talked about at the beginning. Um, it's definitely going to appease anybody who's a gore hound. So uh, don't don't get cold feet on it. Don't be put off if you feel like, oh, maybe I wouldn't normally look up uh, a queer themed film. Um, I assure you this is for, you know, queer and straight allies alike. If you're a fan of horror, you're going to get what you want out of this movie. So it's coming soon. Thanks. Nice. I'm excited for all of that. That's awesome. awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. And anything that uh, you want to share with me that I can like share with everyone else, I'll link it all so they can... Uh easily find it so uh oh so yeah that's that's awesome um and uh, as always roger uh thank you for joining me for another episode of back to the blockbuster for our tales of horror series where we get to enjoy all these horror movies during spooky season uh next week i am doing west craven's new nightmare and the fog so that's what i'm gonna be recording oh i need to clarify it. the original fog because someone got really it was like you're doing the remake now i would never do that. <laughs> I mean, I guess I could do the remake. The, the, orig the original fun. Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> get so stoned before you do it. Yeah. But yeah. Before you watch okay. it, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's coming up next. Uh, and you can find us wherever you get your podcasts, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods. Those are our great, but our podcast network is Playlist, and they have a playlist you have that you can get from the iOS store or the Google Play store. So look that up if you have some time also you can subscribe to our uh back to blockbuster page on youtube if you want to see our handsome mugs as well so yeah thank you guys so much for listening roger once again thank you for joining me uh whenever you want to come back on if you ever see anything on our social media because we always put up movies that are like hey we want to discuss this one it doesn't always have to be horror if you want to talk about any other movies and you want to jump on uh feel free to let us know uh oh yeah it was a great conversation so like i you, you. you'll probably be a welcome guest again so um yeah, yeah thank I love that. I love that. Thank you so much yeah. for joining us. And until next time, guys, peace out.